Hello, everyone. My name is Benjamin Day. And I'm Jillian Mason. And this is Medicare for All, the podcast for everybody who needs and loves their health care. Um, uh, <laughs> it's actually a podcast for people who hate their health care, most I, of all. <laughs> I'm not allowed to change the intro up from time to time. Um, <laughs> Only when it's accurate. Only when it's accurate. We are a hater podcast. All that right. is our identity. All right. You mean, is this because your partner just got a colonoscopy and the, the cognitive dissonance <laughs> is just too much? <laughs> I can't pretend anymore, Ben. You know and love your health care. Mm. All right. Well, today I am coming to you from my dining room table. Uh, things are mm. out of control in this house. But uh, this is a great episode. Um, it's one of our non-episode episodes because, you know, usually, Jillian, we try to expose the inner workings of the for-profit health care system with devastating effectiveness, I might add. Mm, but savage. today we have a special treat. Uh, we're going to bring you behind the scenes into our office here at Healthcare Now, the nonprofit organization with Jill and I work and where we fight for healthcare justice. Now, just like the TV show, The Office, we, you know, we have our own hijinks and wacky characters, including some very smart interns this summer. Um, now, they may not have burned down the office yet, but they have prepped some of their burning questions for this episode. Mm -hmm. So let's get into it. And as Michael Scott says, I hope YouTube comes down to take this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that you agreed to this frame, even though you're the Michael Scott in this situation. I totally am, yes. Ben is our executive director at Healthcare Now. He is our boss, technically. <laughs> Um, and so why technically, <laughs> <laughs> I actually know exactly why no need to explain carry it's on. So messed up. <laughs> I say that every time it's awful. <laughs> um, it's from working in the labor movement. No one wants to be called a boss. Um, right. this is true. Regardless, uh, world's best boss, Ben Day. Um, uh, the and Michael I brought Scott YouTube with me office. as well. I brought YouTube all the <laughs> YouTube way down with me. Brought YouTube with you. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah, so we got some questions from our interns for this episode, which is great because they are, as a you know, they're very smart. They're smart people. Right. And they're about, what, what would you say, a month and a half uh, into the, the their summer internships. So we have six interns, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mostly from the Boston area in Rhode Island. So we've got one intern who's in Puerto Rico right That's now, true. which is yeah, very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and they're great. They're mostly, they're all students and uh, a lot of them are studying public health. Um, and they are all super passionate about taking down our for-profit healthcare system. And we love that. So what we did was we asked them to each come up with two questions for this episode. And I want to say four of them did it, but we'd like <laughs> to take this opportunity right now to shame um, <laughs> <laughs> to shame Mario and Sally, I won't mention your last mm. names, but you know who you are, um, who did not submit questions for this episode. And we knew you would have had the best questions too. <laughs> and this is why we're so disappointed. <laughs> the reason that I insisted that we should say their names is because I figured they probably thought that they would get out of being mentioned on the episode if they didn't submit questions. But I was like, no, nah, that's not how it works. Right. Thank you for Boom. your amazing interns. Roasted. Interning, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're still great interns. We love you. We love you so much. Um, very cool. Uh, All right. so, I can't yeah, wait to hear what they ask. They have, they have questions for us. Yes. They have All questions right. for us. All right. So why don't we dive in with, uh, with Noah, um, mm -hmm. who is one of our awesome interns from Austin College. OK. So oh, here we go. Uh, so Noah asks, um, this is an easy question, Jillian. Softball to start off the episode. Mm, okay. in, in your opinion, what is the most effective way to organize and advocate for Medicare for All? Um, no pressure. With a brick and a porch uh, pitchfork. <laughs> no? I'm not it? Um, I think, you know, we talk all the time about the what we think is the most effective way to organize for Medicare for All, which is the way that 
every social movement that has ever been successful has done so, um, which is to start at the grassroots and talk to people. Um, I always tell the story about Cesar Chavez. Someone said to him, a uh, young activist said to him, well, Cesar Chavez, how do you organize? And Cesar Chavez said, I talk to one person and then I talk to another person and then I talk to another person. And the young activist was like, no, nah, but like, actually, how do you organize? And Cesar Chavez was like, uh, I talk to one person and then I talk to another person and then I talk to another person because that's actually what organizing is. Those, uh, small relationships, right? Um, that, you know, eventually build power when we reach a collective. But, but Jillian, I have a question, question mm -hmm. from the audience. Uh, so if that's how you organize effectively, you mean that you don't win by like getting Oprah on your side or <laughs> well, or by everyone raising a ton of money and then putting billboards up everywhere? No, everyone wants the billboards. Yeah. We honestly get at least one call a week from someone who's like, <laughs> why aren't you putting up billboards? Um, or have a really big march on Washington. Oh, the really big march on Washington. All of it is like, okay, all right. Those are mm -hmm. things that feel super good, right? Like it feels good to say we have billboards up. We had a big march on Washington, right? And it's good to feel good, but it's really not the most effective way to actually make change. It's through those relationships in our communities, those relationships um, that then, you know, kind of create these like, like, you know, larger networks like healthcare now um, that become that become vehicles to actually make change. That's my thought, Ben. But are you <laughs> but I also don't want to discourage Oprah from supporting. Yes, Oprah. exactly. <laughs> no, these are the uh, quick fix solutions we often hear from folks. Um, mm -hmm. And I, my theory is and I I'm actually very sympathetic to this. Uh, people want to find any way to avoid talking to, to other normal people. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it turns out that's the only way to do good organizing, which is just terribly bad news for, for many people. It is uh, really a shame. <laughs> it is really a shame. Despite our profession, Ben and I are both introverts and would prefer right. never to talk to anyone. Yeah. yeah. So they, they are um, looking for a, a lot of people want to look to shortcuts to kind of jump to the end stage tactics, like the mm -hmm. radical stuff, the exciting stuff, or the find someone who already has a lot of power to like do the work for us instead of building the power ourselves. Sadly, no social movement has really ever won that way. And mm -hmm. neither will we, especially given how much money is at stake in the health care. Yeah, so. yeah. I also think it's worth mentioning that like, you know, someone like Oprah doesn't come out for Medicare for all um, just because like, you know, this is her personal opinion, right? In general, someone like Oprah comes out or, you know, uh, uh, sorry, celebrities in general come out for issues where there are people on the ground making noise, you know, where they have fans who are like, you should take a position on this issue. So again, like even those like high level solutions, like if you want a billboard, right? How yeah. the hell are you going to pay for a billboard? You know, Ben and I barely make a living wage. Uh, <laughs> how how are we going to pay for this billboard? Well, the obvious answer is that we would have to crowdfund it, right? And how do you do crowdfunding? You build relationships with individuals. You talk to one person and then the other person and the other person, right? So like even these big top line solutions that seem like they would be like, easy wins. Um, you, you can't actually do them until you have a base of power on the ground. That's true. You know, celebrities and companies who have money at stake are not going to support Medicare for all unless it's profitable for them to do so. Hashtag make Medicare for all profitable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. On to the next question from Noah, uh, his second. And uh, this may be why we don't we're afraid to talk to people. Um, he asks, <laughs> do you have any funny stories from an experience meeting a member of Congress? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Sure. Absolutely. You know, um, I think, you know, Ben, you were saying when we were reading over these questions, uh, you were saying that we don't really do that sort of shit. Not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, healthcare now is built to... For us, the national staff, we are very intentionally not put in Washington, D.C. Healthcare now since its inception was kept out of D.C. because um, they don't want the staff to be kind of directly becoming lobbyists and lobbying legislators. They really want us to focus on supporting you all building a grassroots network in, in district and lobbying your own legislators from, it, from within the district. So, so we don't do a lot of it. We, we're not going to have like a million 
uh, lobbying experiences like folks who are DC based do. But we, okay, after but racking our brains, we have some. We do have, we have some. A couple. <laughs> we have a couple. Right. We have a couple. Uh, so, uh, one thing um, that I used to do on a regular basis when I was with moveon.org was um, to, uh, we had a senator um, back in the day uh, in Massachusetts whose name was Scott Brown. You remember Scott Brown, right? Oh, yeah. And his centerfolds. <laughs> centerfold. Yes, he was notable for two reasons. One is that he was a right-wing Republican, and the other one is that he had a centerfold, I think, in Cosmo at some point. I thought it was Playboy or something. Back before he was a politician yes. or whatever. <laughs> I just remember that for the Pride Parade, some business put a giant blown-up version of it in their, <laughs> in their window, like along oh the my Pride God. Parade. Epic. Uh -huh. So good. Um, anyway, this guy was a real tool and, um, and he, he thought he was going to be president someday. And this is all part of a general pattern that we have in Massachusetts of, uh, you know, st local politics are all, uh, dominated by Democrats. Um, and so like sometimes like statewide offices end up going to Republicans. I think that people just get bitter at their democratic politicians, <laughs> their democratic city councilor, and they're like, fuck you. I'm voting for a Republican for governor or senator. Anyway, so I used to go to Scott Brown's office to talk to him. I forget what it was about at this point. Um, it was probably about taxation. Um, I've lobbied on a bunch of different issues before, right? So we would go and we would talk to him about taxation. And um, it, we we could never actually meet with Scott Brown. We met with his chief of staff for his district office. And um, and this guy was such a townie. I, I have never even met before all he ever wanted to talk about was the relationship between whatever policy we were bringing up and dunkin donuts that's all he cared about you know this would be <laughs> my first thought was does anyone outside of massachusetts know what a boston townie really is but i think now yeah. movies have probably popularized <laughs> this enough that we're now like a stereotype the, the yeah. townie is probably like a yeah uh-huh uh huh, like a a, a Ben Affleck type. I'm just How saying. is this going to impact my dunks? That's a oh, really maybe important even question. Like a Casey Affleck type. Mm -hmm. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but yes, all he cared about was his Dunkin' Donuts, and um, and so like we would be like, you know, oh, we think we should put a wealth tax on the top one percent, and he would be like. But how's that going to affect the local Dunkin' Donuts franchise? Not at all, my friend. Not <laughs> at all. <laughs> Not likely to be a lot, except maybe yes. some people will have uh, money in their pockets to buy some Dunkin' Donuts, mm -hmm. some working people. Oh, rich um, people go to Starbucks. They don't go to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> true. They do. Or Obama Pan. Yes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, so there was that guy, but we we would sit with him for hours. He, he just loved talking, and you know whatever. Uh, so we would just sit with him for hours and have these conversations, mostly about Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, and so I guess we developed a relationship with him. And this is one of the things that we're easy always bonding yeah. organizers. Yeah, right. You have a conversation with someone, all of a sudden you have a relationship with them. And so I can remember at one point there was an immigrant rights uh, an immigrant rights process that was supposed to happen in front of his office and scott brown's director called me and told me asked me to cancel it he was like can you call off these protesters we have a relationship right <laughs> and i was like bitch i may be a white lady but my name is not karen you know <laughs> you're not karen leader of the immigrants uh, oh, come on. i'm so come disabused on, <laughs> i was like yeah we don't have that kind of relationship sorry <laughs> Yeah, and that was before Karen was Karen too. Not sorry at all. Um, but one one example of this, right, of meeting legislators, um, and we actually met the legislator himself. I always think about this Barney Frank story that we may have told previously on the podcast, but we should tell again. Yeah, we have at least once because we, I, I know that I know prior to you joining Healthcare Now, we did a podcast episode on do marches and protests work. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of the March on Washington, that we just need to build a giant March on Washington to win Medicare for all. Um, we had a, a district meeting with Barney Frank, a long, long, long time representative from Massachusetts. He was kind of a one of a kind character, even though he is now somewhat disgraced after um Oh, he's like 100% disgraced. Yes. Okay. All right. I, I add to the percentages of disgracement. Um, because <laughs> he's a lobbyist now for like yeah. the finance industry. Yeah. 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 Which he initially re regulated. But anyway, um, he was he was like a very um, uh, funny but 
very grumpy person. He was like a bit of a stereotype. Can you know? I just say that when we first met him, uh, I said, um, cause he's from Bayonne, New Jersey, um, mm -hmm. which let me tell you is about as shitty as the town I'm from. <laughs> very close though. And, uh, and I said, you know, oh, uh, you know, it's so good to meet another New Jerseyan. Um, you know, I know you're from Bayonne. I'm from North Plainfield. And he said to me, I know I'm going by North Plainfield on the highway because it smells so bad. Wow. <laughs> he told me <laughs> my, I was a constituent and he told me my hometown <laughs> smelled. <laughs> wow. So yeah, yeah, the guy was, the guy was pretty. Uh, that's about par for the course. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he yeah. seemed to take, I mean, this is. <laughs> A lot of Massachusetts legislators basically can't be challenged. They're un unseatable, un un unseatable. Mm -hmm. So the primaries mm -hmm. are a joke, and he had been there forever and ever. So he seemed to take a real uh, zest in treating his constituents like shit. I think. Um, and yeah. but I think also many of their constituents probably enjoyed that because we are from Puritan New England. Uh, <laughs> we, we like a little bit of abuse heaped upon us now and then, as long you as know it's you from deserve the right place. it just a little bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So uh, we had a constituent meeting to try and get him on board the Medicare for all bill. He had already been a long, long, long time supporter of the Medicare for all bill. So it was kind of like a, like, why do we really need to have this meeting? You should have just signed on and told us not to show up, which we'd be happy to do. But for whatever reason, he took the meeting. Uh, we met him in the district office. He walked in and he said, yeah, of course, I'm going to sign on to this. So there's really no need to have this meeting. We agree with you. Uh, but, you know, the activists who were in the room, the constituents who were there wanted to, like, take, you know, advantage of the time to talk to him <laughs> and have a conversation with him about Medicare for all. And so one of our uh, one of our activists from the district said, you know, I think to win this, we just need to have like a huge like get a million people to march on Washington. And um when Barney Frank uh, gave basically the perfect response to this proposal, he said, the only thing that marches in Washington uh, put pressure on is the grass in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it was it was an epic one liner. Uh, but he, he did elaborate. He said, you know, we he said we have giant marches basically every single day in D.C. and Ca Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And he said, when I look out my window and I see a march. I have no idea how many of those people are my constituents. It doesn't matter if there's a million people, two million people, three million people. So he doesn't care unless they walk into his office or call him. Um, and at that point, you can skip the march and just have your constituents go into his office. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, that was a yeah. good experience. We I've, I have a lot more, like way more whacked out experiences with state legislators back when I was at MassCare, the Massachusetts Medicare for All group. But uh, we'll we'll leave it at those two nuggets. Scott Brown. <laughs> Scott Brown was a great throwback. Barney Frank also. Uh, funny throwback. Good times. Yep. <laughs> good times. Oh, man. So, uh, okay. So, thank you, Noah. Those were some really good questions. We really appreciate that. Um, and uh, giving us the opportunity to tell anecdotes is definitely right up our alley. So, good work setting us up for that. Um, yeah. All right. So, next we have Golmina, um, who is amazing and is a uh, also a student of public health um and she is fantastic and she actually has some policy questions for us oh lovely are you ready to go with the policy questions i hope so i hope so all right so she says when we talk about medicare for all are we thinking of a system with government-run hospitals and government-employed medical professionals do you think such a concept garners resistance or are people open to that paradigm shift well, first part of that question is a bit of a softball, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Gomina. <laughs> Don't make it too hard on us. As, as we all know, the, the most common way to attack Medicare for All is to call it socialized medicine. Um, socialized medicine is the, I don't know, uh, I think it's it, it's been used as an attack phrase in the United States because it sounds like socialism, maybe? Is that the, mm -hmm. uh, like, guilt by association? Mm -hmm. uh, but re referring to... Um, there's very few countries actually that have a socialized medicine system, but the United Kingdom does. Uh, where again, not a socialist country. It, it's exactly. Good not to point out that these things are actually close. kind of separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, the entire socialized medicine system is uh, defended and supported by the conservative uh, party that is in power right now, and um, 
has actually been, they're actually trying to deprivatize their system <laughs> right now, which is kind of interesting. Politics are, are really different here in the United States. Um, so yeah, in the, in the United Kingdom, obviously, uh, both uh, your insurance, your health insurance is public. The universal health insurance plan is public, but so are the hospitals and physician networks. They're uh, civil servants, public employees, uh, which if you think that's the end of the world, um, just think about teachers and firefighters and cops who, guess what, they're all civil servants. Um, it does not bring capitalism to a crashing halt. Um, and actually, it, 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 you know, the United Kingdom is not a perfect system, but their problems do not have to do with them being uh, a, a publicly managed, publicly owned system. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. But with the kind of Medicare for all that we're fighting for, right, is, is somewhat different, right? Yeah, I mean, here in the United States, and I, I'm not at all opposed to a socialized medicine system. I think it actually would be better than just Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. um, but we are uh, picking our enemies one at a time. <laughs> we have enough <laughs> already, I think. Um, so, you know, at, at this point, and, and, you know, the good thing is that when you have a Medicare for all system, universal health plan, it does give you a tremendous amount of power to influence kind of what happens at the provider level. Um, to, to sort of add actors and to limit how much profit taking can take place at the expense of patients, you know. Um, so it, it wouldn't eliminate for profit providers right away, the Medicare for all system, uh, but it would give you a tremendous amount of power to to sort of uh, rein in uh, potential bad for profit providers um, or non for bad nonprofit providers as well, which there's plenty of here. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. readings yeah. from Massachusetts. Yeah. But the question of whether people are open to that, um, I actually don't know. There's n I, I don't think there's been enough of like a national movement or dialogue about socialized medicine uh, to gauge what how the how US residents would would respond to that but like yeah. you said it's like that term right has become a kind of attack term um and one of the reasons we use medicare for all is because it's not socialized medicine. Right. right although i have seen at least one poll where a majority of americans supported socialized medicine so mm -hmm. maybe it's slipping i mean a surprising percentage of the population supports socialism as well uh, way more yes. than you'd be led to believe by political discourse about it so. especially amongst younger generations exactly which is exactly very yeah. exciting mm -hmm. um yeah love it love it love it uh but we do think that people are open to the paradigm shift of having a universal health care system for sure right and we oh, know yeah. that medicare for all itself is very popular as well yeah yep. yeah all right so glomina has another question here all right nice Second question is, would Medicare for all include long-term care for the elderly, such as nursing homes and hospice, which is a great question because mm -hmm. it's actually something that's been kind of a debate within our movement um, for universal health care, right? Yes. If, if by debate within our movement, you mean the grassroots debating with our legislative leaders for like over a yeah. decade now. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah. That's yeah. how debate works. The <laughs> constituents are like, please don't oppress us. So right. Politicians are like, Let's debate this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A debate in, in our congressional leadership, but not really in the movement. So uh, the answer is mostly is mostly yes. Both, uh, both Medicare for all bills would include long-term care. Uh, the, the House bill that Pramila Jayapal has is more generous. It basically has comprehensive coverage of, of long-term care services. Um, the Senate bill um, has come along by, uh, you know, inch by inch by inch, um, and now would cover um, home-based long-term care, but would not cover institutional long-term care, um, such as in, in nursing homes and mm -hmm. hospice, just like uh, Galmina was talking about. Um, a couple things, though, I would I would just flag from her question is that you know long term care is not just for the elderly or yeah. for older people; it's also for folks with disabilities uh, very frequently. Um, and that uh, when we think of long term care, we should not just think of nursing homes and hospice uh, like institutional based care, where you're leaving your house and um, moving into a facility. Essentially, um, in fact, there's been a big national movement to try and get more people able to access long term care by staying in their homes or at least staying in their communities where they're embedded. Yeah. Um, there's a in a very perverse um, weird setup. We uh, a lot of people uh, to get long term care have to get Medicaid coverage for it. Um, they have to spend down their assets. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So almost no one has like private long-term care insurance. It, it exists. You can buy it. I don't know anyone 
who has it. Um, so if you end up at the end of your life really needing expensive long-term care and you don't have insurance, um, the only thing you can do is to basically spend down all your bank accounts, sell your house, use the money from your house on long-term care. And then when you're poor, you get on Medicaid and then Medicaid will pay for your long-term care. But here's the really fucked up part. Medicaid has what's called an institutional bias where Medicaid is not as likely to cover a home-based long-term care, uh, but is much mm. more likely to cover uh, institutional care by moving you into a nursing home or an independent living uh, facility. Which is some serious bullshit for so right. many reasons. But like one of them is that like uh, institutional care for folks with disabilities or, or folks who need long-term care is actually much more expensive than providing care within communities and providing home care. Um, providing home care creates jobs. Um, there's a really cool campaign called Caring Across Generations that I got mm -hmm. to work on for a while that was all about trying to build alliances between healthcare workers and uh, and patients uh, to talk about um, long-term care issues. So right. love it. Check them out. You have a special political system when you can create a policy that is more expensive, <laughs> is <laughs> worse for patients, worse for taxpayers. It's, like, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it's really, really special. So um, yeah, so mm. Medicare for all, we would cover that. Um, again, we would like to see the Senate bill a little bit stronger, but the good news is he, he's covering, uh, his bill, uh, the Sanders bill is covering home-based long-term care, which is what we want to orient ourselves towards more of anyway. Mm. Uh, but there are going to be some people who will need institutional care and they should be covered as well, so. Nice, nice. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. All right, cool. so, oh, I get to ask some questions now, so. Please. Um, all right, so I'm going to take Joanna's questions. Joanna. Um, yes, one of our interns hailing from a country that has universal health care. Um, it must be a shocking transition to the U.S. Do you want to say what country that is? From Greece. She's from Greece, <laughs> yes. Um, so um, here is uh, Joanna's question. First question. Uh, considering that you have been a part of the movement since before Medicare for All was introduced by Senator Sanders in 2017, how did you first hear about single payer healthcare and what drove you into the movement at a time when it was not getting much or any question mark media attention? <laughs> Fair question mark. This is such a great Gen Z question. It's like before <laughs> Bernie Sanders, how did you even hear about Medicare for all? <laughs> We had to read the the print newspaper, Jillian. <laughs> <laughs> we looked people up in the phone book. And right. We them. Um, well, I'll tell you the the first person who ever told me about universal health care was Ben. Ben Day. You, Ben, the owner of the I'm dog honored. that's barking in the background of your house. <laughs> He's very upset about this whole. Uh... <laughs> yeah, but I always, I always tell the story that like I had this one like supposed friend who was like a, in in the finance industry and was very successful in the finance industry. And when I got sick and my, uh, you know, as an adjunct professor, my health insurance uh, really covered nothing. She said, um, if your job doesn't give you good health insurance. That's capitalism's way of telling you that your job isn't important and maybe you should get a new one. <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> so when I met people like Ben who were like, actually, no, that's some bullshit. <clears throat> I really you appreciated that. You should be able to have your job and your health too if you want both. Hey, <laughs> I mean, it's revolutionary. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, so yeah, so Ben was the first person who told me about that, and that was back in 2010 or 29 or something like that, right? All right. So you just convert confirmed all the Gen Z biases that you literally had to by word of mouth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair I was enough. like imagining us now like around a campfire, and you're like, <laughs> in England they have a system. It's all single payer. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Substitute the fire pit for like a <laughs> right. you know a bar in Cambridge or something like that. <laughs> Jillian, I just got this pigeon that arrived with a message. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I so, but but so that um, that answers for me, right? Mm -hmm. Then is how I knew that single payer healthcare existed. How did you find out it existed? It was much the same. I actually I found out. Uh, I mean, I, I found out the 
when I lived in England, I found uh, out what a universal healthcare system was. I actually, but that I, I think knowing what a universal health, that health universal healthcare is out there and that it's a possibility is different from knowing there is a movement in the United States that you could be part of, you know. Um, and part of the thing was, I think for when we kind of uh, were introduced to the movement, it wasn't a huge social movement across the country, right? It was a yeah. much, much smaller movement. Um, so, you know, I only found out about the existence of the movement when I like applied for a job at MassCare. <laughs> I was like, and uh, actually, and I, and I, I found MassCare at a, an in-person job fair. I was walking around at boot, booths. Uh, I was not, you know, indeed.com or whatever. I was like mm -hmm. talking to people. And I was like, oh, what are you? You're an interesting one. Um, <laughs> and, and that's how I discovered there was a single payer movement. Um, so it was old timey, but I think it reflected less the, um, I don't know, the information infrastructure at the time and more just the, not as strong of a grassroots movement. And that's why there wasn't a Bernie Sanders back then. There wasn't mm -hmm. the sort of social movement to to enable candidates to run for president and run a viable I mean, campaign on that topic. So Bernie Sanders did exist then. That's important to mention. But he yeah. was not the Bernie Sanders. He was yeah. not the celebrity Bernie Sanders we know that's and love. That's true. And we should say he was giving the same exact speech back then as he does today. So all right. Uh, next question from Joanna. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. What could be done? Oh, and this is actually a perfect question for you, Julian, given your ex life that you've just talked about, your ex job, oh, right, uh, yeah. previous job. What could be done to get more support from academics like economists, sociologists, public health professionals, et cetera, in advancing the movement? Existing research seems to show that there would be many gains uh, for the federal government and the American public. So why aren't more researchers advocating for it? This is such a great question. Such a great question, right? Because it's like, you know, yeah, all the facts and figures show that we should have single payer, right? So why are the facts and figures people not out on the streets being wild about this, right? Uh, makes perfect sense to me. Um, and yes, my previous life was as an academic um, forgive me. Um, but <laughs> so I would say, I think that we're actually going through a period now where academics are starting to feel a little bit more radical, um, where I think you're going to see a lot of academics coming out um, about political stuff. Um, I'll tell you that I think one of the things that works against us in terms of getting academics on our side um, is really that academics in this country right now are totally under attack. Um, so, for example, in Texas, uh, you know, my partner teaches at a community college um, and, uh, you know, now there are all these laws that professors in Texas, you know, can't force students to espouse a political belief or try to get them to espouse a political belief. Right. So there are all these different. Uh, regulations that have been put in place, um, a, a, in addition to the kind of traditional, like, academics, you know, feeling that they should be somehow distanced from the world a little bit, like an impartial observer or whatever. Um, but I think that as academics realize that uh, that being impartial is not going to save them at this point, um, I think you're going to see a lot more people speaking out for that. So honestly, I think that the best thing you could do uh, would be for folks right now who are students to talk to your professors, right? Um, talk to you, uh, talk to the people that you come into contact with in uh, in school, and uh, and and tell them how important it is to you that they take a position on this issue. Right. I think that's a good a good answer in general, which is when we, when we talk about any constituency and we're like, why aren't they more in, for, in favor of Medicare for all? Why aren't they out in the streets? Usually the answer is we haven't organized them yet. No, <laughs> and, yeah. We'll and and it's not it's not to blame the, the cat, the group of people or the community of people, but to say, all right, we have more organizing work to do. And it's actually good to have large categories of unorganized people out there. Because it mm -hmm. means there's way, way, way more people to tap into. And as you've mentioned already, uh, working in academia is not what it used to be. Um, it is for many, many academics. It's, uh, you know, uh, tenure, uh, non-tenure, uh, part-time work, not covering health benefits or any other benefits, trying to scrape together many, many, you know, multiple classes from different institutions. And even folks in tenure track jobs, I my partner is an uh, academic who went through the tenure process. Like that is just designed to stifle uh, any, 
any political freedom until you get through yeah. to the other into through to the other end, and then you have a little bit a measure of sort of security. But by that point, they've also broken you. So <laughs> <laughs> it's also true. Oh yeah. So that's actually another thing that people can do if they want academics to take more activist positions is to stop state legislators, state legislatures right now that are trying to take away tenure privileges for academics. Mm -hmm. Because right now, tenure, which is the kind of basically makes it's a position where you're very difficult. It's very difficult to fire you. Tenure is the only protection that really allows people to speak their mind right now. So the fact that that's actually being eroded in different states, particularly southern states and texas yes is a problem. Uh, my partner is german uh and in germany basically every worker has tenure in every job which <laughs> it, it it just means that they have to have cause to fire you right which is actually kind of a nice basic worker privilege so complain all you want but um all right so that that's Those that's the questions from Yoana. great questions great questions Yoana. love mm -hmm. it Yoana's a total badass we love mm -hmm. Yoana. we love them all though um all right so to to round us out here to to finish us off i have some questions from lucy all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gotcha um lucy is great what school does lucy go to again um oh god i'm gonna get in trouble tufts i think i believe I that's so hope I'm yes it right. yep. yes yes um and lucy actually uh studies community organizing right i don't think so <laughs> oh i don't my think god. so but... sorry we really should have gone through this yep. before yep. This. <laughs> I, I really love you lucy all right. So Lucy asks, what do you feel like is the hardest part of running this organization and mm. how do you prevent from getting burnt out? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, hardest part of running the organization is easy. That is supervising the interns. No, <laughs> no, um, no, the, for me, I mean, this is a very individual thing for me. It's fundraising. Um, I think it's, you know, a, at least for our type of a, a nonprofit organization where, um, you know, we don't take any corporate donations. Uh, we have almost no foundation dollars. Um, we don't have any like big, huge, massive individual donors. Uh, we're basically cobbling together hundreds and hundreds and thousands of small donors. Um, and the donations really fluctuate quite a lot from year to year, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when I first started at MassCare, I was like, uh, it, I was really shocked to have a job where, you know, you've got your your budget for your household budget, which you have a certain amount of control over, but then you have like this separate budget for an organization that is so small, it's almost the same as your budget. <laughs> like if, if something goes wrong with it, it has just an immediate devastating impact on your own budget and you just have a, less control over over the incomes and expenses, it's it's kind of like launching launching a small business. Um, yeah, but for a good cause. Um, so yeah, that's I think is the hardest part. And you know, donations fluctuate with the political winds. You know, um, you might think when Bernie Sanders runs for office, people everyone starts giving to Medicare for all. It's actually the opposite. Everyone stops giving you and starts giving to Bernie. So every every four year cycle for the last two presidential cycles we've had a huge drop off in in individual donations when bernie runs and then there's just other things you know when when it doesn't feel like there's a political window to pass medicare for all people donate less it's just really really tough um and stressful um but we we're we've been stable and active and able to continue our organizing for all 10 years i've been here so that's uh that's better than a lot of nonprofits can say actually so Way to go. Way to go, complain. Michael Scott. That's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Keeping the, the, the branch going. Um, <laughs> and, and how do you prevent from getting Dr. burnt Miffin. out, by the way? <laughs> oh, drinking. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's mostly, it's mostly substance abuse. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for yes, asking. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> no, the other thing is, and uh, this... This might also speak to you, Jillian, but um, hmm. a lot of nonprofits really believe in um, working working employees to death to death. Um, oh yeah, they they think because it's a good cause, um, and also this this often comes, I think, with foundation funding or funding that comes with strings attached. Um, you you know, organizations want the money, so they'll take the money, but will overcommit to 
Uh, mm -hmm. how, how much staff time it takes to carry it out. And then yeah. you're just kind of working people to the bone to get it done. Um, God damn it. So, I feel attacked by this. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, I, I actually am not even thinking of your former organization at all by this. At this. I'm just thinking <laughs> like nonprofit world in general. I think yeah. this is kind of the norm. Um, yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think in often employers in the nonprofit world think, you know, you're passionate about this. You believe in this. You should be willing to put in overtime. Um, you know, uncompensated extra hours, basically, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not for us, we're not making money off your back, it's for winning the cause. Um, but in my experience, you know, social movements, we win with volunteer power. Um, so we literally cannot accomplish more by having staff put in like ridiculous extra hours. Um, mm -hmm. We need to be, uh, staff just need to be moving more and more power into the hands of volunteers um, and responsibility and all that stuff. Um, so I think actually the less staff do, the more powerful the movement can potentially be. Um, I mean, don't get us wrong. We put in our hours, but, uh, healthcare now has always had kind of a philosophy of not, not working ourselves to death. So, uh, partly it's just an organizational decision not to burn people out, but. I mean, we do this, we do this work, right. So that people can have decent lives and it, it doesn't really do us much good to make our lives. Uh, miserable in order to try to achieve that. It sounds so simple when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, why do I feel guilty every day? It's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Self-exploitation is a real thing. I, I have no. done that on occasion. So. All right. Wait, hold on. No, I'm going into a spiral of self-loathing. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lucy asks, what is something healthcare now has achieved that you feel proud of? Oh, that is an excellent question. Besides hiring Jillian Mason as your communication. Which was our crowning achievement, really. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think um, I'd say two things. Um, one is just how far the movement has come uh, in the last 10 years, which, you know, healthcare now, we can't by ourselves take credit for that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, we were, we were there and active kind of before that leap took place. And the leap kind of enabled the movement to spiral way beyond the scope of healthcare now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm proud of the role we played in like, you know, enabling just, you know, doubling, tripling the number of co-sponsors in Congress, just uh, massively spreading the number of grassroots organizations working on this, the number of activists working on this um, and just turning it into, I mean, when I started, if you said single payer healthcare or Medicare for all, no one would know what the fuck you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, almost no one, unless they were like, you know, the top 5% of politically engaged people, you know? <laughs> um, but now it's pretty common discourse. It's really filtered down. People at least know what you're talking about. And we've pushed it, I think, into the number one issue within the Democratic Party, which is where we have to win it anyway. So that's number one I'm proud of. Um, number two, I think uh healthcare now has kind of come more and more to see our role as elevating patients who have been impacted by the, yes. the, the healthcare system um and again when i started in this movement um i say this a lot so i apologize if i'm repeating myself over the course of episodes but um the, our, our movement was mostly led by by policy experts by both academics um researchers but also i think doctors who do research um, highly educated folks who maybe themselves have not been dramatically, uh, you know, it's not like they've uh, gone through gaps of insurance coverage or had their finances threatened by a medical incident. Um, many of them do see the the impact on a day to day basis of the terrible healthcare system, um, but we know that that's that's not alone how social movements win. They really have to be the folks who are directly uh, impacted by the healthcare system moving into leadership roles, organizing themselves, uh, calling for change, uh, being the voices of change. So I think that's kind of been our singular mission, especially in the last four or five years. And I'm I'm proud of of the, the strides we've made on that, that front. And I'm hoping we do even more uh, with yeah. the Voices of U.S. Healthcare System project we're going to launch soon. Yes. Stay tuned for more about the Voices of U.S. Healthcare, which is going to be our big project where we elevate patient voices from all around the country. It's going to be so good. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Those are, those are good answers, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud of those things too. Now that you mm -hmm. mention it, um, <laughs> it's really good. But so let's go in the other direction here for a second. What all are right. some common misconceptions about the work that you do? Ask Lucy. 
Oh, misconceptions about the work you do. I mean, I, I kind of feel like if you ask someone about the work I do, they would have no idea. I mean, really? <laughs> they would have no idea the what we do. I mean, people see the work that the that healthcare now does. I think, um, but small nonprofit land is a really world weird world. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you are on screen Medicare for All podcast. You, you're looking at the whole staff of Healthcare Now right here, Jillian and Ben. One, so that two. means uh, all of the things that have to be done by our organization are done divided in two. <laughs> um, so, you know, you would like to consider yourself a director of communications, but you're the director of many, many other things too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I am like to call myself an executive director. I'm executive directing one person. I'm mostly doing half the work of the organization. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, I think people would be surprised. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's hard to minim what I what I try to do is to maximize how much of my time I can spend on like the the stuff we really want to be doing, you know, yeah. like organizing work and supporting organizing work, and we want to minimize the work we do in the other stuff, like bookkeeping, accounting, financing, fundraising, um, just you know, uh, coordinating meetings, um, yeah. answering yeah. emails, answering phone messages, voicemail. Uh, it's impossible to get rid of all that stuff, but. Um, if, if people knew the drudgery we, we have to deal with, then, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a, a misconception or not, but that's what the reality of it is. So it is very difficult to address misconceptions because so right. many people are really just not clear on what, what we do. What the fuck do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I just always think about, um, our friend Jill Parkinson from TikTok, um, over in Vegas. And, uh, when we first met her, uh, she was, you know, I was like, well, hi, I'm Jillian. I'm an organizer. And she was like, oh, I'm also an organizer. She like helps people organize their closets and stuff like that. Oh, I know? see. Right, right, right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Very different conceptions mm -hmm. of what an organizer mm -hmm. is and does. <laughs> um, but Jill is actually becoming also a political organizer. And I just mm -hmm. want to shout her out as a, a future force in, in our political landscape. Um, so, um, but I also just wanted to say that my parents have a really mistaken idea of what I do for a <laughs> okay. living. Uh -huh. um, uh, all they really hear is that I'm like mouthy for a living and they, <laughs> they just like worry every day that I'm going to get into trouble or, and, or get arrested and, or get sued. Um, and so, <laughs> I mean, I've been arrested maybe like all four are in the cards possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. So I've been doing this work for like 15 years and I've got arrested five times, but literally every day, if I say like, you know, and then we're going to do X, Y, and Z, my mom will be like, don't you get arrested. Don't you go to jail for this. And you're like, okay, mom. She doesn't want to see you in the clink. She does not want to see me in the clink. Mm -hmm. But then I pull out the old Catholic value stuff and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, but mom, dad, y'all tell me about what's right and wrong. How can she... I not do anything when I know something's so wrong? She'd be willing to die for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> died for that. I once actually had a. <laughs> Jesus died for our sins. You might not know this. But... I, I heard. <laughs> um, uh, I once actually had a, a fortune teller at Occupy, like at the actual Occupy Boston camp. Right. Wow. Um, he he told me that I would eventually die for what I believe in, and uh, I was like, "You totally say that to all the girls. Like, this is clearly <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is an ego stroke." Right. What activist doesn't want to hear that? You know, straight out of the books. <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure why I started talking about that. Let me go back to Lucy's mm. questions, which are much more on point than the various ramblings I'm doing here. Um, and OK, so here is a uh, final question from Lucy. All right. To bring us all home, uh, Lucy says, what are some smaller action items people can take to support the movement? Um, uh, for example, what are the most accessible aspects of supporting this movement for people who feel as though they may not have the time or energy to devote a lot of themselves to it? Oh Another God. great question. Talk about bringing it home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, number one, probably the most easy action you can take is to donate to healthcare now. <laughs> <laughs> Did I did I mention the stress and anxiety we go through doing fundraising? Mm -hmm. You you can really alleviate all this. Um, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, no, I think uh, what I would do is uh, go to the Healthcare Now website, go to actions, and literally 
uh, we don't ask anyone to do anything big as a first step. You can't mm-hmm. even do anything big on the website if you want to. You'd have to call us and somehow get us on the phone and talk us into getting you to do something really, really big. But the, the type of stuff you can do is sign up for the email list. So you're just kind of like in the loop and you know what's happening and when it's happening. And when you have an opportunity to or a moment to do something, you'll know when you can have like a real impact. Um, Because, you know, maybe the easy thing for you is to just call your legislator or email them or something. But it only really makes sense to do that when the bill is introduced and blah, 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 blah. So get in the loop. That's like a big one. Uh, We have a tell your story uh, form, which is another really powerful one. Again, bringing us home to the Voices of U.S. Healthcare Project that's going to be launched here. You can share your uh, your story, or if you, someone you know, a loved one was impacted by the healthcare system, mm-hmm. that can be your story as well. Uh, Jillian, what else you got for small baby step actions? You know, honestly, I think that um, I, I think that that storytelling one is the way to go. Right. Um, and we always we always talk about that in our organizing. But um, I know I I actually came into the movement from ter- learning how to tell my story um, about my own healthcare issues, and I believe you did the same. Um, and so um, I always think that that's a great first step. And it really helps us to get out there just how common a problem it is, right? Um, when you post a TikTok, right, talking about your latest problem with your insurance, as our friend Jill did, um, uh, you, you know, your legislator might not see it, right? But do you know who is going to see it? everyone who follows you, all your friends, Mm -hmm. all, you know, your cousin who was thinking, oh, maybe it's my fault that I'm sick right now. Um, You know, your, your mom who was thinking, maybe it's my fault that I signed up for that Medicare Advantage plan that's now exploiting me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's, it's a great way to start conversations with the people in your lives. And it's a really great first step. Now, social media is not how we're going to win, right? <laughs> um, but it is a great way to sort of start getting involved and to, again, start having those conversations with people who are important to you and to whom you are important as well. You could call it uh, relational organizing even. But why would you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's so pretentious. <laughs> Have no. a fucking conversation with someone you like or who likes you. That's a little easier way to put it. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I, But I would say, I would also challenge you. I'd say, you know, for as much as the baby step is the most important one, uh, aim bigger, at least down the road, uh, because we will never win this if uh, the only thing people are willing to do is to click on a petition or to, uh, I mean, telling a story is actually very powerful, but... Um, I think sometimes people care passionately about this uh, and they feel like they're doing something um, with like clicktivism, with like online stuff. Um, and it, it, that is not going to get us to the homeland. So we yeah. are going to need enough people to kind of get more engaged. So um, you know, again, if your life doesn't allow it, um, I totally understand, but at least get yourself in the loop. Um, and hopefully down the road, you can find some bandwidth to, to do, to do more because, um, that's really the only thing that that's going to get us to like winning eventually. So. No. Yay. All right. Uh, well, so, that sounds pretty cool. Oh my God. Jillian, we, did we forget to write the, uh, the, uh, members of the podcast team we were thanking today? correct i was just thinking that yeah oh god damn yeah. it let me pull up the slack channel we well, really we know thought we're... the interns were going to do all the work for us this episode, <laughs> so we really slacked off on this um they did most of the work for the episode they did um, all the work let's be honest so we know as usual angelique davis is our podcast manager jerry katz she's writes amazing. all our show notes she's um, amazing and i do see that arena budanova is going to be our audio editor for this episode and our researchers were the interns, at least four of the six of them. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> so, thank you Noah, Golmina, Ioana, and, and Lucy. Lucy. Yes. And, and uh, you know, Mario and Sally, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Next episode. <laughs> Next episode is all on YouTube. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Stay safe and stay dangerous.